All right, hello. Hi, welcome to the Poe Museum, welcome to the Poe Shrine, and welcome to May, although this is the fifth day of May, but this is uh, the first in the May uh, Summer Sunday readings. Uh-oh, some technical problems. Hope you can still hear me. Okay, uh, screen's gone blank, so I'm hoping this is still recording going out to Facebook, but anyway, this is the first reading of the May uh, edition of the Summer Sunday Readings, and uh, for these we're doing a little bit of a, a comic twist. Uh, today I'm going to do Never Bet the Devil Your Head, or actually a slightly edited version of that. Uh, next Sunday we're having a guest speaker. I'm going to do The Raven, and we're going to have a guest speaker who's going to do his own poem, which is sort of a, a parody of the it's called Staff Call. Uh, the week after that, my colleague Debbie Phillips will be doing three Sundays in a week. And uh, for the final Sunday, I'll be doing Hot Frog, which is not exactly a comedy, but we're getting back into the horror of it a bit. Uh, some people, though, have called uh, Hot Frog sort of a horror comedy or something like that. Anyway, we can see what, what you think of it. Uh, so today I'm, I'm reading again a, a edited version of Poe's story, Never Bet the Devil Your Head. Uh, Poe wrote a lot of comedy. It's not as well known, uh, but he did, and I think this is one of the more interesting ones, although again, I've edited it. Uh, if I read it completely untouched, uh, I'm afraid it might get a little tedious. So uh, here it is. And if you like this one, by the way, Federico Fellini, the great movie director, actually did a film based on the story. Uh, in the 60s, the concept of a, a trilogy film was very popular. It would basically be three short films in one. And he, uh, within the, the trilogy film Spirits of the Dead, uh, did one of those short films. It's called Toby Dammit, uh, which is the name of the main character in the story. So here it is, my edited version of Never Bet the Devil Your Head. It is not my design to vituperate my deceased friend, Toby Dammit. He was a sad dog, it is true, and a dog's death it was that he died. But he himself was not to blame for his vices. They grew out of a personal defect in his mother. The fact is his precocity and vice was awful. He had contracted a propensity for cursing and swearing and for backing his assertions by bets. Through this latter most ungentlemanly practice, the ruin which I had predicted to Toby Dammit overtook him at last. He could scarcely utter a sentence without interlarding it with a proposition to gamble. Not that he actually laid wagers, no. I will do my friend the justice to say that he would have soon have laid eggs. With him the thing was a mere formula, nothing more. His expressions on this head had no meaning attached to them whatever. They were simple, if not altogether innocent, expletives, imaginative phrases wherewith to round off a sentence. When he said, I'll bet you so-and-so, nobody ever thought of taking it up. But still I could not help thinking it my duty to put him down. I will not be bound to say that I ever heard him make use of such a figure of speech as, I'll bet you a dollar. It was usually, I'll bet you what you please, or I'll bet you what you dare, or I'll bet you a trifle, or else, more significantly still, I'll bet the devil my head. This latter form seemed to please him best, perhaps because it involved the least risk, for Dammit had become excessively parsimonious. Had anyone taken him up, his head was small, and thus his loss would have been small too. The phrase in question grew daily in favor, notwithstanding the gross impropriety of a man betting his brains like banknotes. But this was a point which my friend's per perversity of disposition would not permit him to comprehend. In the end, he abandoned all other forms of wager and gave himself up to, I'll bet the devil my head, with a pertinacity and exclusiveness of devotion that displeased not less than it surprised me. I am always displeased by circumstances for which I cannot account. Mysteries force a man to think, and so injure his health. One fine day, having strolled out together arm in arm, our route led us in the direction of a river. There was a bridge, and we resolved to cross it. He seemed to be in an unusual good humor. He was excessively lively, so much so that I entertained I know not what of uneasy suspicion. It is not impossible that he was affected with the transcendentals. At length, having passed nearly across the bridge, we approached the termination of the footway, when our progress was impeded by a turnstile of some height. Through this, I made my way quietly, pushing it around as usual, but this turn would not serve the term of Mr. Dammit. He insisted upon leaping the stile, and said that he cut a pit pigeon wing over it in the air. I told him he was a braggadocio, and could not do what he said. 
For this I had reason to be sorry afterward, for he straightway offered to bet the devil his head that he could. I was about to reply when I heard a slight cough, which sounded very much like the ejaculation, ahem. I started and looked about me in surprise. My glance at length fell into a nook of the framework of the bridge and upon the figure of a little lame old gentleman of venerable aspect. Damn it, observed I, the gentleman says, ahem. You don't say so, gasped he at length, after turning more colors than a pirate runs up one after the other when chased by a man of war. Are you quite sure he said that? Well, at all events, I'm in for it now and may as well put a bold face upon the matter. Here goes then, ahem. At this, the little old gentleman seemed pleased. God only knows why. He left his station at the nook of the bridge, limped forward with a gracious air, took Dammit by the hand, and shook it cordiously, looking all the while straight up in his face with an air of the most unadulterated benignity, which is impossible for the mind of man to imagine. I am quite sure you will win it, Dammit, said he, with the frankest of all smiles. But we are obliged to have a trial, you know, for the sake of mere form. Ahem replied my friend, and not another word more than a hem did I ever know him to say after that. Aha, thought I, this is quite a remarkable silence on the part of Toby Damon. At all events, he is cured of the transcendentals. The old gentleman now took him by the arm and led him more into the shade of the bridge, a few paces back from the turnstile. My good fellow, said he, I make it a point of conscience to allow you this much run. Wait here till I take my place by the stile, so that I may see whether you go over it handsomely and transcendentally, and don't omit any flourishes of the pigeon wing. A mere form, you know. I will say one, two, three, and away. Mind you, start at the word away. He took a long look at Dammit, and finally gave the word as agreed upon. One, two, three, and away. Punctually at the word away, my poor friend set off in a strong gallop. In less than five seconds from his starting, my poor Toby had taken the lead. I saw him run nimbly and spring grandly from the floor of the bridge, cutting the most awful of flourishes with his legs as he went up. I saw him high in the air, pigeon-winging it to admiration just over the top of the stile, and of course I thought it an unusually singular thing that he did not, not continue to go over, but the whole leap was the affair of a moment. And before I had a chance to make any profound reflections, down came Mr. Dammit on the flat of his back, on the same side of the stile from which he had started. At the same instant, I saw the old gentleman limping off at the top of his speed, having caught and wrapped up in his apron something that fell heavily into it from the darkness of the arch just over the turnstile. At all this, I was much astonished, but I had no leisure to think, for Mr. Dammit lay particularly still, and I concluded that his feelings had been hurt and that he stood in need of my assistance. I hurried up to him and found that he had received what might be termed a serious injury. The truth is, he had been deprived of his head, which after a close search I could not find anywhere, so I decided to take him home and send for the homeopathists. In the meantime, a thought struck me, and I threw open an adjacent window of the bridge, when the sad truth flashed upon me at once. About five feet just above the top of the turnstile, and crossing the arch of the footpath so as to constitute a brace, there extended a flat iron bar, lying with its breadth horizontally, and forming one of a series that served to strengthen the structure throughout its extent. With the edge of this brace, it appeared evident that the neck of my unfortunate friend had come precisely in contact. He did not long survive his terrible loss. The homeopathists did not give him little enough physic, and what little they did give him, he hesitated to take. So in the end, he grew worse, and at length died, a lesson to all riotous livers. I bedewed his grave with my tears, worked a bar sinister on his family escutcheon, and for the general expenses of his funeral, sent in my very, very moderate bill to the transcendentalists. The scoundrels refused to pay, so I had Mr. Dammoth dug up at once and sold him for dog's meat. Okay. You are very welcome. Yeah, I hope people out on Facebook got that, but I'm not sure. It looks like we're having some problems. So, Facebook folks, if you're hearing me, thanks for tuning in. If not, I guess you can't hear me. Uh, do you folks have any questions about anything? It just occurred to me that maybe the topic of the poem on Facebook would have decided not to broadcast what you're doing. <laughs> having had some issues with my broadcast.
<laughs> ah, well, that's an interesting thought. I, if, if that's the case, I, I, I almost like that. <laughs> okay. So I don't was the reference to transcendentalists also a jive at other poets that were, were followers of that 